Our mom scowled ferociously as he pushed his buggy along the river. He walked through another bridge tunnel. It was deep and inviting, and there were iron rings over which he could hang his things. But the Paris fireboats were moored along the quay. Come a fire on the waterfront and all of Paris will gather on my roof, he mumbled. So he plodded along to another bridge. He only stopped once to watch a man pull in the fishing line because he thought there was a big fish on the end of the hook. But it was only a sodden chew. Ah, that's the way our hopes go, Monsieur Armand sadly told the fisherman. And then he started jumping up and down with excitement. Oh my goodness, that's the mate to the one in my buggy, he cried. That's it. The fisherman yanked the old shoe off the hook and tossed it to Armand. Ooh la la, monsieur, said the hobo, but that just goes to show we should never give up hope. At last he found a bridge shelter that suited him. He spread his canvas as carefully as a family man laying the rug in a new house. This isn't as cozy as the room that canary made for me, he admitted. Funny how those black lines on the concrete kept out the draft. And he didn't sleep well that night. He kept wondering about the children. Were they warm enough? Wouldn't they be lonely? He tried to pretend to himself that he was fretting about something else. It was my bridge, he said aloud. They had no right to put me off my property. I ought to go back and assert my rights. And when he woke up the next morning, he noticed that a light snow had fallen during the night. He sat up and rubbed his eyes as he looked out at the quay. Paris had turned white overnight. Oh, it was a beautiful sight for those who could stand in a warm room and look through a window. What would the children do now? They'd probably play in it and they'd catch, get the death of a cold with no grown-up to look after them. I'll show them, said Armand. I'm going right back there and I'm going to tell them what's what. I'd like to see them try to put me off my property again. So he trundled the buggy and the wheels left wet black lines in the snow and there was no sign of life around the fireboats. But as he neared the old bridge tunnel, two women in fur coats came walking down the quay. In alarm, Armand noticed that the trail they were leaving behind them ended at the canvas propped up against the wall. He quickened his shuffling step and as the two women passed, they turned their heads toward him. Ah, poor wretched creature exclaimed the woman in the black fur coat. Perhaps we should save him, said the woman in the brown fur coat. Oh, go feed the pigeons, jeered Armand. His big footprints erased theirs in the melting snow. He pulled the canvas aside and the children were crying. What's the matter? asked Armand. You still bawling because I left? You might have known I'd come back. Susie pulled Evelyn closer. Two women were here talking to us. They've, they've gone to get somebody. They're gonna take us away and put us someplace, said Paul, wiping his eyes. And they say they're gonna put Mama in jail, Susie wept. Oh, please help us, Monsieur Armand. Please don't stay mad at Mama. Armand kept twisting his beret around on his gray head. And now the soup was spilled into the fire, and he knew women like those two in the fur coats, always trying to make hobos go to work or wash their faces or read books. And now they were picking on children. Must have run out of hobos. It really wasn't his affair, but Morelli had been right. Oh, these little ones. And he pulled his beret down tightly. That was it. Morelli, start packing your loot in your cart, he ordered. We've got to get out of here fast. Women like those two, they don't give up when easy when they have a mind to save poor wretches. He helped the children gather together the few pans and the fold of the blankets. He pulled down the canvas and covered the cart with it. But where will we go? asked Susie. Mama won't know where we are. We can't leave Mama. She's the most of our family. I'll come back and tell your Mama where you are, said Armand. I've got just the right nest for you. He had to help them get their market cart up the steps. And then because Evelyn's feet were so cold, he sat her in his buggy on top of his possessions. He pushed her down the street and crossed the bridges. Susie and Paul followed pushing the cart. If I were a big man, said Paul, I wouldn't let those women be so bossy. Where are we going? asked Susie as they came to the Rue de Rivoli. Are we going to get Father Christmas to help us? 
Armand looked back. Oh, you don't need Father Christmas to help you. You've got me. Besides, he's too busy. It's only four days until Christmas. Will you tell him that we've left the bridge, asked Susie, just in case he does find a way to bring us a house? Oh, don't you worry, said Armand. Leave everything to me. Well, instead of leading them down to the Rue de Rivoli, he waited for the automobiles to stop. He motioned the children to come alongside him with their push cart. They crossed the street abreast, and just as they reached the curb, a taxi cab splashed them with dirty slush. But they kept on going, single file again. Ahead of them loomed a great shed. It was as big as a railroad station and as black and nosy, noisy. The alls, Armand called back to them. That's the big central market where all the food comes into Paris. The children quickened their steps at the word food. I'm hungry, said Paul. Well, you needn't get hungry in the alls, replied the hobo. They sell most of the stuff wholesale. But a fellow like me uh, can sometimes wangle some food there. I'll try my luck. They saw the whole streets were covered with black sheds. Now they had to pick their way carefully. The sidewalks were cluttered with crates and baskets. The pavement was slimy with worn, torn red, white, and blue papers. They kept bumping into things because they were so busy goggling at the sights. Boxes of fruit and vegetables made walls around them. There were long alleys with endless rows of beef, sheep, and hog carcasses hanging on hooks. Men went by carrying great baskets filled with hawks and pig's feet and calves' heads. A man was lifting an immense box. He wore an outlandish hat that made him look like a carnival figure. Who is he? asked Susie, pointing. Why does he wear that funny hat? Oh, he's one of the strong ones, answered Armand. He's mighty proud of that hat because wearing it means he can carry 440 pounds at one time. Oh, can you? asked Paul. Armand shuddered. Oh, la, la, I'll never know, he declared. And they hurried past trucks back to the curb and lines of desks where buyers and sellers did their business. And as they came out into the street behind the alls, Armand met many old friends. Ragged men and women were picking through the old vegetables and fruit thrown into the gutter. Hello, Charlotte, he waved to a bleary-eyed man with his clothing, still together, held together by safety pins. Good morning, Marguerite, he greeted a woman dressed in men's clothes. Found any diamonds in the trash cans? And then he bumped into a six-wheeled metal cart pushed by a man with a tall hat and baggy pants. Well, if it isn't Lewis, he exclaimed, making enough money to pay your rent in that mole tunnel off the place of air. Lewis grinned toothlessly. I can get you a job today. They need more pushers. They always do. Armand started away. I'm pushing, he said, and you can see I've got my own pushers with me. So long. The children hated to leave the alls. They had enjoyed the noise and bustle. And with all that food, said Susie, wouldn't you think they'd spare us just a little bit? They pushed their carts past St. Eustache Church and into a street teeming with other carts. It was as if the great market had spilled into the street in streams of fish and meat, stands and both curbs. Paul stopped to look in the window of the coffee shop where colorful stuffed birds of South America were posed on open bags of coffee beans. The asphalt pavement ended with the Rue Montegriel, became the Rue des Petites Carreaux. Now they tramped over patterns of cobbles so tiny they looked like a mosaic. Armand stopped them when they came to a building with three black Egyptian heads trimming in front, and he pointed to a narrow winding alleyway. Part of the old court of miracles, he said, in the early days of Paris, all the beggars gathered back in there for shelter and nobody dared bother them. He led them into the ancient valley, into the dingy shops. Why did they call it the court of miracles? Asked Susie, because it was like a miracle how those fake beggars shed their crutches and bandages when they came back here at night, exclaimed Armand. They then mm -hmm. made a feast and make merry. They even had their own king they elected. The children looked disappointed to see the rear of a great garage and some more dark stores taking the place of the old court of the beggars. I bet you'd be the king if they, st if they mm -hmm. still lived here, said Paul. Armand sighed. Oh, la, la, those were the good old days, he said. 
as if he had lived in them himself and were remembering. They left the court with its rackish memories. And they passed the doorways of dilapidated rooming houses. In each, they could dimly see a battered old stairway, barely wide enough for a child, curving up to the dark halls above a perhaps magic tower room. Who knew? And looking up at the high window across the street, they saw a queer old lady hanging out her washing on the stretched on lines across the window. And her washing was six red pairs of underpants and six long red gloves, as if she might have been the wife of Father Christmas. At last, they came to an open corner fenced in by the wooden boards, and above it rose the crags of buildings which were slowly being torn down floor by floor. Only the tall, jagged walls were still left standing, like Rocky Mountain peaks. On some of them, one could trace the original rooms by the great squares of faded paper. They could hear a clattering and banging behind the fence as if the workmen were busy at their destruction. But when Armand guided them through an opening, the children's eyes opened wide. The sandy yard was filled with makeshift tents. Two rattle trap automobiles were parked among them. Dark skinned men gathered around a fire beating at old pans with hammers. And there were black eyed women with gaudy skirts hanging over the wet sand. Children with half wild fox faces stared at them. And then five dogs came bounding toward them, snarling and barking. And before they knew what happened, Jojo sprang at the dolls. Dogs. There was a flying, barking mass of fur and growls. And then a gypsy woman came running with a stick. And she began beating the snarling dogs without paying play and favorites. They stopped fighting and howled in pain and fright. And Armand grabbed Jojo and pulled him back. And the gypsy woman dropped the stick and began talking to the dogs in a low, soft voice. They whined a little and then sniffed at Jojo in a friendly way, as if he had now been properly introduced. Armand! cried Morelli. Welcome, old friend. You look as if you've come to stay for a while. She looked at the children. Paul and Susie were peeping fearfully around the tramp's back. Welcome, little one, she said. You will not be lonely here. I will get you something to eat. And she helped Evelyn down from the buggy. We don't come empty handed, said Armand. And he began pulling things out of his buggy. First, a bunch of celery. Next, a couple of apples. Lastly, he proudly held up a dressed calf's head. He saw the little cow say staring at the food as surprised as if he were a magician who had lifted it from a hat. Don't know how that stuff dropped into my buggy, he said to them. Especially with Evelyn on top, I must have brushed up against something in the halls. The gypsy children closed in on the little cow says. The boys were coatless and wore patched pantaloons. The girls were dressed in gaudy skirts that hung to the ground from under their torn coats. Their long black hair was cut in bangs over their beady eyes. But they thought the cow says were the odd looking ones. They fingered Evelyn's red hair. They felt Susie's dark, rough coat and then touched their own gay rags. Your clothes look so sad, said a gypsy girl, but you have happy hair. A gypsy man put down his hammer and greeted them as warmly as Morelli. There is always room for one or 10 more in our camp, he said. You can share the tent with Pedro. Armand, he's in the bed there now. He doesn't like the cold, so he sleeps all winter. Can the girls live in the van with us? cried a gypsy girl about Susie's age. Her clothes were the brightest of all, and she wore golden rings in her ears, but her high shoes clomped like boots because they had no laces. You can live in our tent, a tall boy offered Paul. It's near a bakery wall, so it's nice and warm. The gypsy girl took Susie by the hand. My name's Tinka, she said. What's yours? Tinka, repeated Susie. What a beautiful name. I'm Susie Calsay, and this is my brother Paul and my sister Evelyn. We don't have a home anywhere. I'll show you our home, Tinka offered. I'll show Paul and Evelyn, too. And she led the Calsays through an alley of tents, and the far corner was Tinka's home. The red-headed Calsays gasped at the sight of it. It was a tiny house with a domed roof and carved brown doors and shutters. And instead of sitting on the ground, it was perched on wheels. <gasps> A gypsy house on wheels, said Paul. Now that's the kind of home I'd like to have. We can take our house anywhere we want, said Tinka. 
We just hook it to the back of Uncle Nicky's automobile. Susie's eyes began to burn like blue flames, and she squeezed Paul's arm. <gasps> Father Christmas, little donkey could bring us a house on wheels, she cried. He could pull it. Let's tell Mr. Armand, said Paul. Then he can tell Father Christmas what we've decided.